as a doctor, as a surgeon, we are involved with major surgical interventions. Unfortunately, in our business, this is the only business in the world where a customer can die. No, no, taxi drivers. <laughs> 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 it's uh, however much you try, Sadhguru, to dissociate ourselves. When you are operating, you need to concentrate and do the job, but what comes to your mind is the young wife, young children waiting outside. The margin of error is very small, few millimeters here and there. Then you think what are the consequences on them, then you start thinking about when you are a kid, if something happens to your father, where you would have been. We are after all human beings. We are always torn between what we do to somebody and what, hap what could have happened to our own life. It's a constant tension. How do we overcome it? I've been in this profession for more than 30 years. Still, I haven't yet mastered the art of dissociating myself from the patient's life. Yes, uh, when you are given a certain responsibility which could determine the shape and scope of people's lives, it's a big thing to carry on one's shoulders. But uh, the important thing is that somebody has chosen to place such a responsibility in our hands. It's a tremendous privilege if we execute it. Can we do the best? We can never do the best, but we can do the best that we can do, always with life. Is it the best? No, we are doing our best. If we lack in that, then we have a serious problem. But if we're doing our best in everything that we do, we know it is not the best, but it's our best. We have not spared anything, that's good. And above all, when you refer to yourself as a human being, after all we are human beings, this is a big problem. This will reduce our best. That is, people are always using the word human being as a limitation, as a compulsiveness, as a small thing. We are not referring to the word or term human being as a possibility. Instead of saying we are just human beings, why don't we say we are human beings? We're great, we're doing so many things, we can replace a damn heart. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Isn't it? Yes. Now, uh, replacing a part of a machine is not a big thing. It's like this, shall I tell you a joke? It's okay. <laughs> it just came to me and I saw you <laughs> <laughs> So, a cardiac surgeon took his Aston Martin, which was gi giving him a little bit of trouble, engine trouble, to the mechanic. So he said by evening he'll have it ready. After his hospital job, he went there to pick up his car. It was not ready. The mechanic was swaggering around a little bit and he said, Hey doc, why is it? I do the car's engines, you do people's engines. <laughs> After all a pumping thing, you know. Why is it that you earn in millions? I just make a few bucks. <laughs> Come tomorrow, doc, we'll fix it. So the doctor looked at him and said, try to fix the engine when it's running <laughs> <laughs> That's an important thing. You got to keep it running and fix yes. it. <laughs> Sadhguru, the… Uh, but the great work done by all the senior cardiac surgeons, cardiologists and all the good doctors of this country, heart care has attained lot of… it has got lot of confidence from the people. It's very interesting, Sadhguru, when I started my career twenty-five years ago, I left England 
25 years ago. I started in Calcutta. If I told a patient then… Lot of heartbreak there. <laughs> if I told a patient then that he needed an operation, it required more than an hour of convincing him for an operation. But today, I face a different problem. He's standing in a line. <laughs> <laughs> today, Sadhguru, when I tell a patient, after seeing all the reports that you do not need an operation, I have to spend one hour to convince him why he doesn't need operation. Everyone wants heart operation, Sadhguru. Is it for romantic reasons or <laughs> How do we… how do we convince people that fixing the heart is not like, you know, <laughs> something wrong with your house, you get a plumber, he will fix it or, you know, you're something wrong with the car, you change the parts. It is something different. There are… The, the, we are not the uh, magicians or we are not the gods and the nature is the best healer <laughs> and cardiac surgery is only a fifty-year-old phenomena. People have lived for… I think they have also realized it's a dumb pot <laughs> <laughs> It's a big dilemma for all of us, uh, uh, Sadhguru. Today, people want something to be done on their body all the time. Yes. <laughs> if not heart, many other parts of the <laughs> <coughs> Yes, uh, as I said, uh, probably in another fifty years, fifty percent of the population will be going through these surgeries, which is not health, which is medical industry, but not health. If health has to happen, a culture of health has to come in. Not healthcare systems, not hospitals, not more doctors, not more surgeries, but a culture of health has to evolve. Right now, world is in a way of imitating everything that America does. They eat badly, they live badly, and they have a three trillion dollar bill of healthcare. It's sinking the country, okay? <laughs> it's sinking the whole nation, healthcare. We want to follow the same things. We want to dress like them, we want to eat like them, we want to live like them, and we want to get unhealthy like them, but our country cannot spend three million… three trillion dollars on you for sure, we'll let you die <laughs> Yes <laughs> We're not going to reach out to everybody and do surgery for 1.25 billion people. That's not going to happen in near future. And if it doesn't happen, it's a disaster. If it happens, it's a bigger disaster that people do not know how to live well is a disastrous way. That I would say seventy percent of the ailments on this planet can be just handled with better sense of living, eating, atmosphere, if you manage seventy percent will be gone. You can achieve this in twelve to fifteen years of time on the planet if a determined effort is made by the people, by the policy and by everybody concerned, particularly the hospitals, they can do a lot. Because when they're sick, they listen, you know <laughs> Otherwise they don't <laughs> When they're well, they don't listen. When they're sick, they will listen. They're, they have ears, more ears than two when they're sick. That's the time to talk to them <laughs> as to how to live better. These things are not new to us, these are very strongly rooted in our cultural milieu, but uh, we are throwing it away for something which will bring us a lot of trouble. For immediate attention, for immediate intervention, of course medical intervention is uh, primary and it's most vital, there's no question about that. But long-term health will not happen because of medical sciences as we know it. Long-term health of a society or a nation or the planet will not happen that way we have to bring a culture of health. What is the way to live? What is the way to eat? How to keep our body? How to keep our mind? How to keep our breath? How to keep the atmosphere around us? If this culture is not brought into us from our childhood, I would say it must be brought into the school curriculum itself. It must be brought in healthful ways of living because if you do not build healthy people, 
You're going to have educated and sick people and you're going to build a nation or a world out of it. With sick people, you're not going to build a great nation, you can only build a sick nation. Uh, and that is happening across the world. The major nations are suffering enormous amount of illnesses. The most affluent countries who have no nutritional problems, okay? India's half the problem are nutritional problems, right from their childhood they've not eaten properly. Affluent nations who have a choice of nourishment, look at the level of uh, uh, health issues they have. That should not exist at all. When they have choice of nourishment, they should not have, I would say, eighty percent of the people should not have any health issues till they die. When twenty percent, twenty-five percent will get something, infections will come because of close proximity, those are different. But these are all on self-help. People are on self-help to create ailments for themselves. This can be one hundred percent taken away if we establish a culture of health for which I think not just medical uh, professionals, people from various other areas have to work together to make this happen. I don't see any major synergy like that right now. Small efforts are happening here and there, but that's not enough. It's good, but it's not enough. Sadhguru, majority of the people who fall sick, it's primarily because they led a life which would definitely land them in trouble. But Thousands of children are born in this country, like any other part of the world, with cardiac problem, with cancer, all kinds of problem. They, it is not their fault. Why it happens? It shouldn't have happened. You know, six million Toyota cars were withdrawn last year for defective whatever, <laughs> and about nine million uh, General Motors withdrawn for uh, ignition problems. So manufacturing only, defect. Only problem is you can't withdraw them. <laughs> Actually nature is trying to withdraw them. We are not allowing it. There was a time we would allow the nature to withdraw. Yes? All the manufacturing defects that came, hundred, two hundred years ago we would allow the nature to withdraw. By the time children are four, only the fittest would survive, rest would go. Now we don't allow them to withdraw, so we need a whole lot of things to run the defective cars. I know I'm putting it so blatantly, but you need to understand physical, the physical existence is mechanical. Whether you like it or you don't like it, probably all kinds of sensitivities and emotions are there about this my physical body. But when they come to you, you strip them down and treat them like a machine, isn't it? complex, sophisticated, but still mechanical, isn't it? Yes. There are other aspects to it, but fundamentally mechanical. Anything mechanical, anything physical, there is never something called as perfection to it. It is a constant work in progress. You can improve it and improve it and improve it. What we call as evolutionary thing is just that. Now, the parents, the two machines which produce this small machine, Yes. Okay? What condition are they in? This is also an issue which we have not taken care of. There are… there is a lot to be said which is controversial about this, but essentially this idea that everybody must have children has to go. Yeah, I know I'm getting into trouble <laughs> But we… we are not seeing humanity as a future possibility. We are just seeing it as a regressive way of something that we can extend into future of our own, a footprint. Right now that's a problem. Our identification with the body is so strong, the physical body is so strong, we are unable to think beyond our biological identity. Once you are not able to think beyond your biological identity, the very nature of being human, the immensity of being human is constrained and constipated into a very small process. In this process, there are problems. In the ancient past, they handled this in many different ways which are absolutely, utterly controversial today and can never be brought back into this society, but they did handle things in a completely different way. They bred carefully which is very important. 
We are thinking about… when it comes to animal husbandry, we are thinking of breeding right. As human beings, why are we not thinking of breeding right? Because we are too identified with our own body, it's mine is more important than what's right and the level of suffering that you bring into this fresh life, you know, you see it every day. Yes, yes. Uh, Sadhguru, scriptures tell us that everything happening in this world, including what happens in our life, is preordained. Which and scripture said that? At least that's what I thought that we are destined to do something <laughs> irrespective of what happens. If that is the case, we are destined to die someday, then what's the role of people like us in this world? Oh. <laughs> oh, uh, we are definitely destined to die. <laughs> people, come <laughs> people come and tell me, Sadhguru, this man, my enemy, I can't bear him, I want to do something. I said, just wait, he will die <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to do anything, just wait <laughs> Just be patient, that's all <laughs> So this time to die, yes. But uh, I don't think ever any scripture has mentioned that your life is predetermined, predetermined or preordained. This is an import from outside. You must understand the fundamental nature of what this culture is, is it's rooted in this. This is a godless culture, you must understand this. There has never been an idea of God in this country. It's an imported value, let me put this into perspective. Because it upsets lots of people <laughs> We have many divine entities, many. We count some thirty-three million, something like that. How did all these gods come up? So, the idea, the monotheistic idea is there's a god sitting out there and doing things to you, so they believe in dictatorship, that there is somebody who determines everything. Not so in this culture. Here, there is no idea of god, but there are many divine entities. What are these entities? Generally, if you look back, the language that was used for all the deities that you have is, you're a Devi is a yantra, always a yantra. The word yantra literally means a machine or a device or a tool. When I refer to our own yogic temples as tools, people get offended. Sadhguru, don't say that, it means more than our life. I said, if you are offended by this, you come to the ashram. I am giving… going to give you a plumbing job to do in the ashram without tools. You must use your nails and your teeth and do plumbing in the ashram for three days. After three days, I'll give you a chain winch or a spanner. Will you worship or no? Will you worship the tool or no after having lost all your teeth? <laughs> so the power of the tool, the power of the tool is something that we always understood. We are… Uh, we as human beings, we are who we are in the… on this planet only because of the tools that we have created. If we did not have any tools, a dog would dominate us, isn't it? Yes or no? Yes. It's only because of the tools human beings have become who they are. So there are… a screwdriver is a tool too, but there are subtler tools, energy tools, subjective tools which can open up different dimensions of life. So for this, for every dimension we create a different tool, a different possibility because we clearly know without this tool we would never access this possibility we bow down to it and we worship it because without being worshipful it will not yield to you. This is… we clearly know gods are our making. It is just that others have forgotten. So here we told you, your life is your karma. This means your life is your making. Where is the question of preordained? Such a thing never arises in this culture. Thank you, Sadhguru. But it's dangerous for a doc doctor to think it's preordained <laughs> Today, the medical science has reached a level, uh, Sadhguru, we really do not have to touch the patient. When I see a patient in my office, he would have undergone all kinds of tests, 
Everything is done, all the images are displayed, history is written, everything is planned. Technically, I can see the reports and tell the patient, okay, you need a bypass or you need valve replacement. But I always make it a point to take my stethoscope, put it on the chest, listen to the heart, look at the patient's eyes, put my hand around on his shoulders, touch the patient, and then explain to them what is going on and talk to the family. I personally feel that touch is the, has the most healing power than anything else what we have invented. <laughs> Do you believe in that, uh, Swamiji? See, what is not understood is, yes, one part of us is mechanical, but there are other dimensions. Most of the time, the mechanical part has gone wrong because we have not tended to the other dimensions. So what is lacking in their life is, their life is not touched. Not necessarily a physical touch, it's just a manifestation. Essentially, their life is not touched by anything. When I say touched by anything, it need not necessarily be a relationship. You can be touched by so many things. Uh, I don't know, how many of you… Uh, when was the last… Uh, how many decades ago did you watch a sunrise? Uh, or a sunset, or a moonrise. I'm saying not touched by anything. When was it the last time you waited for a flower to bloom? No such thing. When is the last time you paid an attention to a butterfly, or a leaf, or a flower, or another human being? You're… of course <laughs> You don't like faces, you like the Facebook <laughs> I'm saying contact with life whether it's human, animal, plant life or just elements around you, just that. How many people even take a moment to even look at the food that they're going to consume with a little bit of involvement or are they touched by it? No. So at last either a doctor has to touch it or in the end underca undertaker will touch you <laughs> you know. <laughs> Somebody will touch you, things gone bad, somebody has to touch you. So, does touch have a relevance? Tremendous relevance. Touch need not always be physical, it can be in so many different ways. If you are not touched by life, you are a dying life, you are not a living life. It may happen to you after some time, but it's happening, you're in progression. Because what you call as life, even in the physical level, it's a… Uh, it's medical knowledge for everybody now. The number of cells you have is more than the number of stars in the Milky Way, okay? Every day, over six hundred million billion cells are dying and new cells are being born. That means every second, ten million cells are dying and ten million new cells are born in your body. If you just take… leave the old, old guys. If you just take charge of this new ten million cells every every second that's coming up in your body, if you structure them properly, create them properly, if you have some say in how they will happen, if you have some influence as to how these fresh cells are born, your heart should be fixed, your brain should be fixed, everything should be fixed because that is the level of opportunity you have to rejuvenate your life second to second. But because you're totally oblivious to life, when I say oblivious to life, I want you to look at this. Right now, you cannot even call yourself as a living being because most of the time, what is happening with you is just thought and emotion. Thought and emotion is just psychological drama. It is no existential relevance. Here, a thousand people can sit here and live in thousand different worlds right now. That means nobody is in reality. Nobody is living. Everybody is thinking about life. Psychological space, what happens, has unfortunately overtaken the existential process of life. You do not experience life, you are only thinking and reacting to situations around you. Thought and emotion is dominating everything. So right now, 
Today morning, sun came up on time. You don't think much about that, okay, so what? <laughs> no, you need to understand, if sun does not come up tomorrow morning, within eighteen hours, all life on this planet will largely cease, as we know it. So I'm telling you, sun came up on time today morning. I want to hear appropriate noises. Yeah. None of the planets in this solar system collided today. In the whole universe, no accidents. In this endless cosmos, no accidents, everything going right. But you have one nasty little thought crawling in your head and it's a bad day. I'm saying you completely lost perspective with life. You lost perspective as to who you are. It's a kind of madness. So once you lose perspective as to who you are and what is your… Sp what is your space and status in this exist existence, you are a sickness by nature. It's not the doctor has to diagnose you, it's already on. One day it will manifest to a point where his instruments or his touch will tell him, but it's already on. The process is on. When it goes beyond a point, he'll give you a prescription or a surgery. But the process is on, you're working hard towards it <laughs> There are large number of Indian or Western techniques of healing which may not have scientific data, but they work. And I have a personal experience Many years ago, my uh, wife developed lower backache. It was intense pain, excruciating pain. As usual, I took her to a neurologist, they did MRI and everything is fine, there is no problem, but poor thing, she was I'm really… I'm glad you were not a spinal surgeon, <laughs> otherwise you would have done it <laughs> Then my brother-in-law suggested that uh, I should take her to see a acupuncture specialist. As a doctor, you know, it was a bit embarrassing for me to go to somebody <laughs> and, <laughs> and he didn't have a fancy clinic, I went to his house and he talked to my wife for a few minutes and uh, he made her sleep flat on the floor and Sadhguru, he took, you know, from the, the, the heel he started pressing on a lower back for ten minutes as I was watching. I'm not exaggerating, she never had the lower back pain ever since. I'll show you thousands and thousands like that. <laughs> not with, not I, even with any needles, simply. I was so fascinated because he cured my wife and he did something which I couldn't do it for thirty-two years, she was fine. <laughs> There are many ways of yes. uh, treating uh, people and as professionals, we have to respect all the ways of uh, treating. Definitely, I would say allopathic system is at its best when there's an emergency. When there is time, definitely other systems are way better if you ask me in many ways. Particularly, this is something hardly known to people, in southernmost part of India, largely in Tamil Nadu, we have what is called a Siddha, Siddha Vaidya. It's a most incredible medical system, so comprehensive. There are over 300,000 formulations. I don't think even modern pharmacopoeia has that. Over 300,000 formulations elaborately written down. And the fundamental difference between Ayurveda and Siddha is, Ayurveda is herb-based, Siddha is elemental. The only thing is, the skill level that it demands from the doctor is a challenge in modern world. This is something that you have to live, then only it works. The person who administers it is as important as what is administered. Who administers it? You're talking about touch, so who administers it is important, not just what is administered. But the nature of modern medicine is, you write a prescription, some chemist who knows nothing about it gives it and they take it, it's only purely chemical and it works. But 
when there are chronic ailments, if there is infection, killing it with whatever, you know, chemical bombing it is the way to do it. But when you're generating an illness from within, correcting it from within is most important. If there's an emergency, you have to intervene more aggressively, that's different. But these systems have such a comprehensive knowledge about health and well-being. But the problem is, it needs a lifelong involvement and dedication to become something good with this kind of system. It is not something that you can acquire as a profession and do it. Always it was seen as a sacred duty that you can actually See, I, I want uh, everybody to think about it and I'm sure many times you're facing this within yourself. It's not… it is not a prescription, it is not a surgery, it is not something. It's a person's life, whether he lives or dies. I mean, your existence, <laughs> it's… it's not a… it is not a case, it is not a statistic. For that person, it is the only life that he has. This needs far more deeper attention than just being handled as a profession. I think that sense of dedication and involvement, individual doctors might have grown into it, but still that's not there as a culture, that is not there. It should not be seen as a profession, that's what I'm saying. Yes, of course, monetary requirements are there, that will happen, that's a different thing. But first of all, it must be seen as a… a certain commitment and a certain privilege that you are able to either end or extend somebody's life is not a small privilege. Sadhguru, many years ago when my son was a little kid, he gave me a book written by Swami Vivekananda. He was describing how ancient gurus could communicate with each other thousands of miles away, just by thought. It's essentially, it's like a modern internet, how one computer can communicate with another computer in the US or Europe, anywhere. Do you believe that human mind can be trained to influence another human mind or people's mind who are far away, just by tuning our mind to the right frequency? Can it be trained? Can we… Uh, can we uh, uh, learn that art? You're trying to beat the cell phone companies <laughs> <laughs> It's not just about the mind. See, when we say mind, the English word mind is only generally referring to only the thought process. Thought process is the most surface element of your mind. I think because of European thought, we have given too much significance to the thought. In the yogic science, we do not attach any importance to what you're thinking about or feeling right now because what can you think? Only the data that you have collected, you're recycling it. It's of no great consequence. Whatever is in the surface of your mind keeps rolling. That is not of any consequence. What you're thinking and feeling right now is very surface of mind. There are deeper dimensions of the mind. In Sanskrit language, there are many, many words to describe the different states of mind. But now there is one aspect of the mind, for lack of time and stuff, <laughs> I'll leave those things. There is one aspect of the mind which we refer to as chitta. Chitta is the innermost core of the mind, which is your connection with what we are referring to as consciousness. If your chitta becomes conscious, if your chitta acquires a certain level of conscious control, if you acquire, now you have access to your consciousness. What we are referring to as consciousness is that dimension which is neither physical, nor is it electrical, nor is it electromagnetic. It is a quantum leap from physical to non-physical dimension. A non-physical dimension being the lap of the existence. It is the non-physical in whose lap the physical is happening. Physical is a small happening. In this cosmos, not even two percent or not even one percent is physical, rest is non-physical. This non-physical dimension, in the yogic terminology, we use a specific sound 
which is connected with that dimension, today it's all very highly distorted, we call this Shiva, that means that which is not. We… when we say Shiva, we are not referring to some man sitting up there. We are talking about a dimension which is not, but it is in the lap of this dimension, everything that is happens. So if your chitta becomes even mildly conscious, your ability to not only communicate an idea or a thought, even to deliver something is possible, physically deliver something is possible. So is it a possibility? Definitely it is. Right now, can we teach it to all these people? In theory, yes. But are they willing to work towards it? That's a question mark. One big problem is, our education systems are such, we have glorified our thought to such a place. First to bring that down itself will take time. To make them understand the stupidity of their thought, it will take a whole lot of time. Because everybody thinks they're smart. But actually, the smartest thing about most people is their phone. Because your thought process is just an outcome of the limited data that you have gathered. It doesn't matter if I have read the libraries of the world, still it is too limited compared to what it is, what the creation is. With all the scientific development, we still do not know how a leaf really works. We do not know how a single atom in its entirety we do not know with all the scientific exploration. So that that should be humbling enough for everybody to know that we hardly… we know how to use things, but we do not know what it is. It will take lifetime of attention to even grasp the fundamentals of what it is. So if people are willing to first of all understand like the whims of their heart, you just dismissed as dumb, <laughs> okay? <laughs> if they also understand the… the so-called smartness of their thought process and emotion is quite dumb, now it becomes easy. It becomes easy to train people that communication need… it's not like, now I want to generate this thought and give it to you, not like that. Things will happen to you before you think. What… what is best for you will simply happen to you even before you articulate in your mind. You don't have to ever think what you want to become, how you want to be. Life will just arrange itself. An intelligence beyond what you can contain in this bone box starts working for you and it'll work. You've heard of Ramanujam and others just opened a window with their Devi and he becomes that kind of a mathematician, which is, you know, even today they're… after one century they're still trying to figure out what he said. And the, the mathematical calculations th that he gave is the backbone for describing the black holes in the universe. When he was there, there was no word called black hole, nobody knew there is such a thing. When we say black hole, what we are talking about is the curve of time and gravity, which is something modern science is battling with. He made mathematical background for that. As the curve increases, it… what is in existence, physical existence becomes non-existence. So this is what it is when we say yoga. You reduce the curve in such a way that what is largely physical becomes non-physical. Once it's non-physical, time and space is not an issue. Once time and space is not an issue, communication is simply there. <clears throat> About twenty years ago, Sadhguru, I received a check for one lakh rupees from a retired major from Indian Army. He just gave his name, he refused to… I, he didn't give his address. And he wrote a small note stating that the, the money I am giving you is too small for the path you have chosen. But God has his own mysterious ways of giving you the rest. It had a tremendous impact in what I thought what I wanted to do. Is it because there is something called cosmic forces which are constantly trying to help society and doing or it's something else which is uh, influencing people to do something which is beyond their means? 
See, uh, the ideas of something wants to help, something reaches out to you. I was… <laughs> I happened to be in… in about four weeks ago, I was in Los Angeles and I was staying with some people there. And uh, the bedroom was full of books, so I just picked up one of these books and so on. The author is saying, the core of the universe is love. Well, why would the core of the universe be love? Because this thing has been always told to people, from heaven God loves you, all these people. See, if you are having a roaring love affair right now with somebody next to you, here, will you look up and ask for rays of love to come towards you? <laughs> I'm asking you. No, you made yourself in such a way nobody can love you. <laughs> now, only God can love you. If you say God loves me, you must know you are such a pathetic, despicable <laughs> case. If you made yourself in such a way nobody can help loving you, you are a wonderful human being, isn't it? So when it… we need to understand there is something called human thought and emotion, human needs of emotional needs of love, care, touch, this. The cosmos or what you are referring to as the source of creation or divine or if you want to use the word God because God personifies thing, we will refuse to use that word. Let us say whatever is the source of creation which we are referring to as God generally by religious uh, this thing. Essentially, it is just an intelligence which is simply exploding into everything possible. If you are in rhythm with it, you will rise. If you are not in rhythm with it, it'll crush you. It has no love, it has no compassion, it has no intention of helping you, it has no intention of harming you, it has no nothing. If you understand the forces and ride it, you have a fantastic life. If you do not understand, it'll crush you. You've seen people doing surfboarding on the waves in the ocean. It is such a magical thing, just riding the waves, but if you don't do it right, if you go into the waves, it's like being in a concrete mixer, it'll just do that and it'll kill you. So one rides the wave, another gets crushed by the wave, that is all that's happening. The rest is all human interpretations. This is the first thing we have to stop, that we do not extend our thought and emotion to the existence. This is relevant between you and me. This is relevant between you and your family members. You love them, I love you, you love me, all this fine. Don't look up at the sky and say, I love you. <laughs> it will not say, I love you back <laughs> because it has no such need. It's pure existence. This is what you have to become. If you sit here, you are a complete existence by yourself. This is a full-fledged life. It does not need anything from anybody. It has everything. It is connected with everything in the universe. It does not need anything, but we want to play our games, okay, we can do all this stuff. But you need to understand right now, we are trying to extend our compulsions to the whole creation. It doesn't work like that. Existence is not trying to help you. You may be in tune with it, bingo, you are. Whether you got in tune with it consciously or unconsciously, somehow you got in tune. That's why Sankara said, yogaratava, bhogaratava. That means somehow you do it, I don't care. Your Shankara, Adi Shankara went to the extent of somehow you do it. You get it man, that's important <laughs> How you get it, who cares <laughs> Sadhguru, I am constantly torn between my senior colleagues who are extremely skilled surgeons. Uh, Sadhguru, the, on the heart there are some procedures which are done by very few people on this planet. I'll, I'll give an example. I do an operation called pulmonary endarterectomy. That's the, the blood clots from the leg goes to the lung arteries and it clogs up all the arteries. So twenty, twenty-five years ago there was no cure for this. And once you're diagnosed, you're destined to die within a year. Today, people who are on home oxygen for two years, three years, you do the operation, they can go back to skydiving or they can go to scuba diving. That's the transformative effect. But there are only fifty surgeons, less than fifty surgeons in this world who can operate. And 
Like this, we have some of my colleagues who are extremely gifted surgeons. They are in their fifties now. And some of them are constantly talking about retirement. Especially one surgeon who is an extremely gifted surgeon who can fix any damaged valve. He is single. He has no other commitments. Every other day he talks about going to Benares or somewhere and retire. And I keep telling him that God didn't create him to retire and meditate. He has to be fixing all these problems. <laughs> <laughs> so he gives me extension every six months, Guruji. So at the end of six months, the usual rigmarole starts. He talks about retirement and everybody is depressed in the hospital. So how do you deal with this kind of people? You must, uh, you must give him a one-year sabbatical with me <laughs> Yes, because uh, the, the need or the idea of retirement enters anybody's mind because of the monotony of what they're doing, whatever it may be. Somebody else may think it's a great thing, but in your experience somewhere it's becoming monotonous or stagnant. Stagnation is one thing that human intelligence and human system cannot take and most of the ailments are because of stagnation, stagnation of life. They may be… they may be getting their, uh, you know, once in three years promotion, they may be making little more money, all these things may be happening. But somewhere experientially there is a stagnation which could be a major cause for many of the complex ailments that people manufacture within the systems. The more complex they get, you try to create more talented surgeons. I'm saying we are manufacturing the problems, we are trying to manufacture a solution. I think as we offer solutions, people who have already gotten into problems, they need solution. But it's very important that we teach people how not to create these problems, so that instead of fifty you have to produce five thousand expert surgeons to attend to all these people who are on self-help to illness. So I would say a surgeon who's… Who, ha who has a certain competence and who has worked through his life, if he wants to explore something of his own nature, that would be the greatest thing to do because he's not a man without commitment, not competence. When competence and commitment is there, you should not run him through the regram role and destroy that possibility. It's important that he explores something of his own nature, which will make him… we don't know what he'll come up with. You cannot even estimate what he may come up with. I think a sabbatical <laughs> is good <laughs> He may come up with something that you not thought possible. <laughs> I will… I will convey your message, <laughs> Sadhguru. I'm sure he's watching this program <laughs> <laughs> Sadhguru, I believe that talent is something which is grossly exaggerated in success. It's… when I was in medical school, I used to teach martial art. Uh, that was my passion <laughs> and uh, every time a Bruce Lee's movie was released, all these school kids would come and join in hordes to martial arts schools. We used to call it Bruce Lee They're phenomenon. after two weeks. <laughs> yes. And I used to see some kids whose physic is meant for martial art, who have the natural flair and I used to think, oh, this kid is going to get a black belt. And interestingly, Swamiji, mm -hmm. after six months, they're never there. The guys who go up to the black belt and, you know, do something very good in martial art are the ones who join the school without any skills, without any talent, who worked very, very hard 
for everything they had to sweat it out. But in the end, they are the ones who succeed. How do you explain this phenomenon? <clears throat> See, uh, for a variety of reasons, let me not go beyond this. For a variety of reasons, a certain individual could be born with a certain flair, physical flair, mental flair, emotional flair, style. You know, five-year-old child, one has style, other is clumsy, okay? <laughs> so the one with the style is not going to become necessarily a fashion thing. Somebody else who seems to be clumsy may grow into something else. Like, uh, you don't know when a woman is pregnant, the child within that womb, whether it's a sage or a sorcerer, nor the woman know. No, the mother does not know whether she is producing a sage or a sorcerer or what. This is because, I use the word coherence because of modern science is using that word. Who you are here right now, as you sit here, this is physics. Every subatomic particle is in constant contact with everything. What you call as cosmos is living life and it's a live mind. You have captured only one small part of it. If you work with only that one smart, small part of what you have captured, both as life and as intelligence, you will function at a certain level. If you apply yourself to break the barriers of your limitations that you've set for yourself, then there is an intelligence beyond anybody's understanding, beyond anybody's estimate which is available to you. Once this is available to you, people think you're superhuman. No, this is not about being superhuman. This is about realizing that being human is super. The immensity of being human has not been realized. So we are always making a, a kind of a mathematical calculation. Okay, if this person has this much IQ, maybe this is what he will become. This is what Newton's law, that everything that moves on this planet works to a mathematical precision or a geometric precision. That is, if you take a pendulum, the length of the pendulum will decide how it will swing. If you take a projectile, depending upon its mass, velocity and uh, the, pr the trajectory, it will go to a certain place. That is not how the cosmos is working because what you think is physical and not physical is all mixed up within this, within this human being. The physical self, the psychological self, the emotional self and who you call as myself, the life within you, the fundamental life process, these are all different dimensions and the innermost core of who you are which because all the other words are corrupted, I'll use the word life or just you, what you call as me. This, if you allow it, if you do not identify it with any form, with your physical form or with other different identities that you take on, it has a, a way of being cohesive or collaborative with everything around. When we say somebody worked hard, all he is trying to do is stretch his boundary of identity, isn't it? He's trying to stretch his boundary. If he succeeds to set, stretch his boundary, something that was… he never thought possible or imagined that is within his competence or capability becomes his. Miraculously, I can show you hundreds of people who come to me, we prepare them for a certain period and then we initiate them. In twenty-four hours, you will see the shape of their face will change. Genetics are altered in twenty-four hours' time. You can see the photographic images, they have actually changed dramatically overnight simply because of a certain extension of their identity. So, in the Indian spiritual milieu, see when you say spiritual, we must understand this. This is not about looking up or looking down. When we say spiritual, we are talking about transcending the limitations of physical. So right now, the physical is here as if it's a solid entity in people's experience. But modern physics is telling you and medical science is beginning to telling, tell you, or if people don't understand, if they just hold their nose for two minutes, they understand that they are not an independent existence. It is in transaction, not just in terms of breath. Even on the level of subatomic particles, it's in constant transaction. If this transaction becomes even minutely conscious, 
suddenly you have immense capabilities that you never thought were possible. Biological identity is the most limiting identity that you have because it limits to the area of your body. Now when you strive, you break this. It doesn't matter in what way you strive. Most people strive in unconscious, unscientific, simply out of striving, they do things. But there are ways to strive scientifically in a proper way. There are tools to strive with specific direction to break the limitations of who we are. If you break this boundary, the subatomic particles are transacting, the intelligence is transacting, only you're missing the whole game. If you don't miss the game, if you are in the game of life, not in the game of thoughts and emotions, you are in the game of life, suddenly just about anything you want you can do, not this or that. I'm saying anything can a human being can do, simply if he breaks his barriers. And these barriers are many levels, but the most fundamental thing is the identity.